All right, welcome everyone. So today, what we're going to be looking at is actually measuring alleles. Because if you remember in the past couple videos, what we talked about was to show evolution, we had to have a change in the allele frequency. Well, today, we're going to show how we actually measure that change in the allele frequency. How we're going to do that is we are going to use a specific tool. That tool will allow us to calculate an actual frequency of our alleles. But the thing is, that tool also has limitations. And those limitations are going to reveal to us that the allele frequency has changed. Recognizing a tool's limitations is extremely important when you go about doing your scientific research. The tool that we are going to use today is called the Hardy-Weinberg equation. The Hardy-Weinberg equation works with as many alleles as we might have for a specific gene. For our purposes today, we are only going to look at a gene that has two different alleles. We are going to use the variable P for the dominant allele. And because that allele is a dominant allele, we're going to make it a capital P. For the recessive allele, we are going to use Q. And because it's a recessive allele, we are going to make it a lowercase Q. Now, if this specific gene only has these two different alleles, then the frequency of these alleles is going to be equal, sorry. If this specific gene only has these two different alleles, then they would account for the total number of alleles in this population, which means that the frequency of the dominant allele plus the frequency of the recessive allele is going to equal one. So that gives us our equation P plus Q is equal to one. Another way of saying this is that the percentage of dominant alleles plus the percentage of recessive alleles is going to equal 100% of all of the alleles within our population. The next equation is based upon the different genotypes that we can have. So the first genotype that we could see is homozygous dominant. And the homozygous dominant, we would typically write as capital P, capital P. If we were to solve this out algebraically, that means that it would equal P squared. On the other hand, heterozygous, those individuals would either be PQ or they could be QP. If we were to solve these two different algebraic equations together, we would get 2PQ. And lastly, we can look at homozygous recessive as being QQ, which would equal Q squared. If we were to put all of these together, we would recognize that the homozygous dominant percentage plus the heterozygous percentage plus the homozygous recessive percentage would equal 100% of the total genotypes in our population which also could be written as P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared is equal to one. In other words, the frequency of homozygous dominant plus the frequency of heterozygous plus the frequency of homozygous recessive is equal to one. So we have two different equations. P plus Q equals one which is the frequency of all of the dominant alleles plus the frequency of all of the recessive alleles is equal to one. And the frequency of homozygous dominant plus the frequency of heterozygous plus the frequency of homozygous recessive is equal to one. Or P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared is equal to one. So how do we use this? If we were to have a population, if we had a population of 100 individuals, and of that 100 individuals, 62 of them exhibited the recessive trait, 
then we would know that those 62 individuals are also homozygous recessive because the only way to exhibit the recessive trait is to be homozygous recessive. And if we know that 62 out of 100 individuals are homozygous recessive, then that means we know the frequency of the homozygous recessive individuals. It would be 62 divided by 100. It would be the number of homozygous recessive individuals in our population divided by the total number of individuals in our population. So Q squared is going to equal 0.62. And if Q squared is equal to 0.62, we can quickly calculate what Q would equal. Because remember, Q squared, that's the frequency of individuals that are homozygous recessive, but it is not the frequency of all of the recessive alleles in our population. Some of those individuals that have the dominant phenotype are heterozygous, which means they have that recessive allele. The question would be, how many are there? Well, what we can do is we can take the square root of Q squared, and that will give us Q. So by taking the square root of 0.62, we get that Q is equal to 0.79 which also does mean that 79% of all of the alleles in this population, they're the recessive allele. Sometimes people think that the recessive allele is less common than the dominant allele. That's not the case. It all depends on the percentage or the frequency of that specific allele. And in this case, well, the recessive allele is extremely common. Now, if Q is equal to 0 0.79, we can really quickly calculate out what P is equal to because P plus Q is equal to 1. And if P plus Q is equal to 1, we can use Q to solve for P. Breaking it down, P plus Q equals 1. So P plus 0.79 is equal to 1. Solving for P, we get that the dominant allele, it has a frequency of 0.21, or 21% of the alleles present are the dominant allele. And now that we know what P is, and we know what Q is, we can solve for P squared, and we can solve for 2PQ, the frequency of homozygous dominant, and the frequency of heterozygotes in the given population. In this case, what we have is P squared, we take 0.21, square it, and we get 0.05. So the frequency of homozygous dominant individuals in our population is 0.05. For our heterozygotes, we would take 2PQ, so we would take 2 times 0.79 times 0.21, and that gives us a frequency of 0.33. So 33% of the given population is going to be heterozygous. And lastly, we already know Q squared, and it is 0.62. A good self-check is to add these together and see that they do indeed equal one. What this also means is that 5% of our population is homozygous dominant, 33% of our population is heterozygous, and 62% of our population is homozygous recessive. And since our population was 100 individuals, then I know that of that 38 individuals that were appearing dominant, five of them were probably homozygous dominant, and 33 of them were probably heterozygous. To bring this back, we started with the homozygous recessive individuals because we had a completely dominant trait. If we had an incompletely dominant trait or a co-dominant trait, we could have started at a different point. But 
if the trait exhibits complete dominance, you must start off with the homozygous recessive individuals because they are the only ones that you know the genotype of because of the phenotype. The dominant individuals could have been either heterozygous or homozygous dominant. We couldn't be sure. Let's do an example. If we take a population of 142 mice and 58 of them are what we would call a goody, which is a recessive trait, then we quickly can figure out how many of these individuals are probably homozygous dominant. The way to do this, again, we start off with the frequency of our homozygous recessive individuals, and that would be Q squared. 58 divided by 152 is going to give us Q squared because it's the number of individuals that are expressing the recessive trait divided by the total population of mice that we have. And that gives us 0.41. So we have point, a frequency of 0.41 when it comes down to our homozygous recessive individuals. Taking the square root of that will give us that Q, our recessive allele, it shows up at a frequency of 0.64. Going step by step, we then can calculate that P must equal 0.36 because 0.64 plus 0.36 is equal to 1. And P plus Q must equal 1. Now, from there, I have the, all the variables that I really need to solve for 2PQ and P squared. And so 2PQ, that is equal to 0.46. So I know that the heterozygous should show up at about a frequency of 0.46. And P squared is equal to 0.13. Now, I really didn't need to solve for 2PQ because that's not what the question is asking. The question asks only for the homozygous dominant genotype. So using 0.13 as my frequency that would be homozygous dominant, I can calculate out that if point, the frequency is 0.13, multiply it by the total population of 142 individuals, that 18 of them are probably homozygous dominant. Let's try another problem. So we now we have 43 agouti mice. Again, that's the recessive trait, so they must be homozygous recessive, of a total of 142 mice. So this is just like the last problem, just change the numbers a little bit. How many, again, would be homozygous dominant? Give it a shot, and I'll be back in a few to give you the answer. When I solved this out, I got about 29 mice. Is that what you got? I hope so. Now we're going to look at what the requirements are for the Hardy-Weinberg e equation to work. And here's what it takes. The first thing is it takes an extremely large population because when you're counting the different individuals, you can make errors in that count. That's called sampling error. So to avoid or to minimize the amount of error that you have in your counting, you must have a really large population. Second, random mating. The organisms can't be able to choose their mate. If they choose their mate, then there could be a certain preference for an allele. There could be a certain preference for a specific trait. And for Hardy-Weinberg to work, there can be no mate choice. Next, no migration can be allowed. If organisms can move in and out of a population, that will clearly change the frequency of the alleles. That can introduce a new allele, that can make an allele completely disappear because that population moves. So there can be no migration at all. 
The populations must stay where they are and no individuals can be allowed in or out. Next, no natural selection can occur. Organisms must all be able to survive equitably. Otherwise, a certain trait could disappear because it's not favored. An organism cannot be outcompeted against. If that happens, then the trait that it has is going to disappear and that's going to change our allele frequency. And lastly, there can be no mutations because every single time that there's a mutation, that every time that a mutation would occur within a specific gene, it creates a new allele. And you can't have the creation of a new allele and keep the allelic frequency stable. And what does this tell us? What does this show? Well, unfortunately, it shows us that in the real world, Hardy-Weinberg equations don't consistently work. The reason, it's very simple. First, most populations are small. If you take a pride of lions, it's typically only a, a maximum of 30 individuals. So you're not going to have a whole large population that can actually interbreed. Even if you take really large groups of animals, they're not that large of a population in the grand scheme of things. Next, there's going to be migration. Organisms are able to move in and out of different areas all the time. This is a fox that I took a picture of in my front yard the other day. Quite honestly, I don't see it all the time. And it at any point in time could get chased away by another fox that moves its territory. This fox is able to move wherever it wants to go. That freedom of movement hurts the Hardy-Weinberg equation. Next, we know that mating is not random. There's mate choice that exists out in the wild, whether it's with the deer where the males are going to compete against each other so that the females will choose them, or it could be where you have birds with their different plumage or the different courtship ritual trying to attract a mate. The reality is out in the wild, mate choice takes place and that means that specific traits are going to be favored and other traits are going to be disfavored. Natural selection takes place. Some organisms are able to outcompete other organisms based upon the natural surroundings that they exist in. Some predators are going to be better at hunting down their prey. Some prey is going to be better at getting away from predators. Some organisms are going to be better at getting whatever resources or nutrients they need. Other organisms are going to fail in that endeavor. And when they fail in that endeavor, they don't pass on those alleles. And lastly, we know that mutations do happen. When your DNA is replicated, it cannot be replicated perfectly every single time. And that means that a mutation is unavoidable. And since mutations are unavoidable, new alleles are going to be formed. So what does that actually tell us? Well, in summary, first thing is that the Hardy-Weinberg equation can be used to measure out allelic frequencies. It can give us an estimate of the allelic frequencies and of what we would think the genotypic frequencies would be for our given population. Again, it only works in a narrow scope though. It doesn't always work because there are strict rules that it must adhere to. And yes, that means that even in the lab, you might not be able to keep your population in what's known as Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, or where the Hardy-Weinberg equation works out every time and where your allelic frequencies stay the same. So most populations in the wild are not in what we would call Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. In other words, most populations, you cannot calculate their actual allelic frequencies because of the pressures around them, whether it be through mate choice or natural selection or anything of the type, 
you cannot actually use the Hardy-Weinberg equation to truly solve what the allelic frequencies are. What this shows us then is that indeed the allele frequencies change. And if the allele frequencies are changing, then actually what the Hardy-Weinberg equation does is it proves that evolution happens. If evolution did not occur, then we could always use the Hardy-Weinberg equation to solve the allelic frequencies in a population. But the fact that the Hardy-Weinberg equation fails us many times shows us that evolution takes place. Allele frequencies change. That's it for this time. Be awesome. Stay awesome.